Good evening. And welcome to the party on the green, the official celebration of the East Lake Cup. I'm Ingrid Saunders Jones, a retiree of the Coca Cola Company, but most importantly tonight, I am a friend and a fan of the East Lake Foundation. If you've attended Party on the Green in the past, Tonight's event will look a little different and a little younger. That's because <laughs> this year we've combined Party on the Green and the East Lake Cups opening night ceremony, bringing together two of the East Lake Foundation's signature events for this festive occasion. For those who may not be familiar, the East Lake Cup is golf. Channel's annual collegiate match play tournament that hosts the NCAA's top four men's and women's golf teams for three days of intense competition. The East Lake Cup and donations from tonight's event support the East Lake Foundation's Cradle to College Education Initiative to one, help young people reach their highest potential, and two, to support COVID-19 recovery efforts to help families as a result of the pandemic. So I want to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors. You'll see their, their, them listed on the screen from time to time, and to all of you for, for your support tonight because you're really making a difference. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Each year to kick off the East Lake Cup, we are proud to present the Tom Cousins Award recognizing one man and one woman who are excelling on the golf course and in the community. Presenting the Tom Cousins Award tonight is Lillian Gianelli, the president of the CF Foundation, East Lake Foundation's board member, and the daughter of Tom Cousins. Lillian, come on up. Okay, Catherine said they were here, and here they are. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. It's really good to see you. And it's really good to see everybody in person in our room together tonight, and particularly our college athletes who have had to manage through a year of playing offline, playing under difficult circumstances. So we're so delighted to see you here, and thank you for letting us celebrate with you. Um, as many of you know, and as Ingrid just explained, one of the traditions of the East Lake Cup is recognizing the recipients of the Tom Cousins Award, which honors student athletes who excel academically and through engagement in their community. It's my privilege at this time to recognize our two recipients for this year. Our first honoree has excelled, excuse me, our first honoree has an excellent grasp of his stature as a student athlete and the unique gift that platform presents. This individual shared that he has had a tough year, as many of us have. He was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety and began to feel, to feel that golf, his first love, was starting to slip away from him. It had become a burden, and he had no motivation to play. Fortunately, he found that he could make himself happier by helping others around him. He states, Throughout the process of hosting the, the, there we go, sorry. I used my experience to help others around me and especially my teammates and coaches who surround me. I have used my role as a student athlete to inform people about the struggles of mental health and give them the strategies to help avoid falling into the rabbit hole I fell into. So I'd like you all to join me in congratulating the 2021 Male Tom Cousins Award winner, Dylan Stewart, representing Oklahoma State University.
Well, how, how is everybody doing tonight? Um, first of all, I want to thank every single one of you guys for being out here tonight and making this night so special. I um, also want to thank the East Lake Foundation for everything they do and everybody that has made the East Lake Cup happen this week. Um, as a golfer for Oklahoma State, I mean, this is one of the best weeks that you could play and travel for the team with. Um, so, obviously, as Lillian mentioned, like, I suffered with some depression and anxiety, and it wasn't, like, I wasn't in the best mind state, state of mind. And so, I figured, how can I get out of this? And by doing that, I figured out, I love to see other people smile. I love to see other people laugh, be happy, love on each other. So that was the first thing that I went to. And I mean, I hit a home run with that because sometimes you find things and you strike out. But I found out that if I help people and create almost a domino effect, so like with coaches and the teammates, I teach them the things that I went through and strategies to you know, come out of that. Um, and then they can help their families, the people that are in their lives. And then as a big family, like at Oklahoma State, we have a huge family that's all united in orange. We can all help each other that way. And so I just want to thank everybody again for being out here. I am completely starstruck. Like, I'm just in all, I'm, uh, I'm very honored to receive this award. Um, it means a lot. And Tom Cousins, the stuff that he did in this community is unbelievable, and I couldn't even imagine that. He had a vision to change this area, and he did it with golf. And I think as golfers, um, you're not just a golfer. You're more than that. You're a human being, and use your platform, like I have, being a student athlete, to impact the lives of other people. Um, and one thing I want to leave you guys with is a quote that my dad told me while I was going through all of this was, have your thoughts and acknowledge the thoughts, but you are the driver of the bus. Those thoughts are in the passenger seat. So every single day, make sure that you're driving that bus and don't let the thoughts take over. Thank you. Our second honoree perfectly embodies the spirit of this award. She possesses a wonderful perspective on how golf and her platform as a student athlete can make an impact on others. During the pandemic, she noticed the negative impacts of the pandemic on the golf industry that left playing professionals with financial hardship and countless industry professionals jobless. Together with a friend and fellow college golfer, she organized the Senior Cup, a Ryder Cup style match play fundraising tournament for high school seniors who missed their final spring and summer junior golf season. The tournament was a huge success and raised $40,000 to support the Emergency Golf Fund and the AJGA's Achieving Competitive Excellence ACE a grant. She states, Throughout the process of hosting the Senior Cup, I realized the possibility of utilizing my fortunate position as a college golfer to impact lives. After seeing the state of the world around me, I knew I wanted to use golf to make a difference, especially for junior golfers with the potential to earn scholarships and golf industry professionals who struggled to make ends meet during the COVID. Please allow me to congratulate the 2021 Female Tom Cousins Award winner, Phoebe Brinker, representing Duke University. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so first of all, I just want us to all give another round of applause to Dylan, because I think his story is so inspiring. And I just think that over the past year, all of us have been through so much. So give another round of applause. <laughs> so
So um, first, I would just like to thank the committee for selecting me to receive this award, as well as my coaches, my teammates, and my family. I am so thankful to be selected as the 2021 Women's Tom Cousins Award recipient. And it's an honor to be recognized by the East Lake Foundation, which has done incredible work um, to utilize the game of golf to transform the East Lake community. Um, so my passion for golf has really shaped me into who I am today. And I know all of us can say the same who are competing this week. It all started playing with my family and now I'm lucky enough to further my education at an incredible university and play every day with teammates who are my best friends. Having the opportunity to be a student athlete gives us the unique opportunity to give back to our communities. Even small gestures, like giving a kid on the range a, golf, a college logoed golf ball can make the world of a difference. In these ways, golf has taught me the values of hard work and humility. So when the pandemic hit, I realized the effect that COVID had on the golf industry and it left so many playing professionals with increased financial hardships and countless industry professionals jobless. And so Taylor Roberts, a fellow friend and a collegiate golfer, and I hosted a tournament with the HAGA Leadership Links called the Senior Cup to help revitalize the golf industry in any way we could. And hosting the event was such a rewarding experience and we raised over $40,000. And so just a little background on the two um, foundations we um, gave money to. So the Golf Emergency Relief Fund supports a wide range of people who make up the golf industry, allowing them to continue working in golf and spreading the sport in their communities. And then the AJGA ACE grant benefits junior golfers who aspire to play co collegiate golf by providing financial support, and it really opens the door for them to earn college golf scholarships. So I am so proud that Taylor and I were able to use golf to raise money and ensure people could continue working and playing golf despite financial burdens. Um, and finally, um, as student athletes, we can all look at the foundation's mission of promoting community development through golf. Tom Cousins and the East Lake Founda Foundation have proved that golf is more than just a game and we all have the capacity to use our gifts to impact someone else's life, even in small ways. So thank you. So once again, congratulations to Dylan and Phoebe. And uh, you may have noticed there are several groups of young people around the room, all dressed alike. So in addition to those two fine young, young, young remarkables are some student athletes that are going to be here for the weekend uh, through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We would invite you all to come out and see them play. Um, and I would recommend that all of you take a good look at all these young people's faces because they are the future stars of the LPGA and the PGA Tour. And we're going to be really excited to be able to claim them as, as participants in the Eastlake Cup when we see them in, in future tournaments. Um, I am going to take this moment to introduce the teams that are here. Um, in the women's division, we have the defending Eastlake Cup and NCAA champions, Ole Miss. Raise your hands. <laughs> Along with Oklahoma State. Arizona. There we go. And I hate to say this like this, but Duke. Um, <laughs> well, it's for all my Tar Heel friends. The men's division features Pepperdine. Also the defending East Lake Cup and NCAA champions. Oh, it's Pepperdine, as well as Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma State. There we go. And Arizona State. Of course, none of this would be possible without the support of our East Lake Cup co-presenting sponsors, ZipRecruiter and Uber Eats. 
We also want to thank Worldwide Technologies, Bridgestone Golf, Mercedes-Benz, and Top Golf for helping to elevate what has become a highlight of this college golf calendar. We look forward to seeing you out here to play. Also, please be sure to turn into the Golf Channel, which will be broadcasting the tournament live. And we look forward to a great week of golf. Thank you, everybody. Wow, let's give all the student athletes and golfers a big round of applause. Woo! That, that was great energy, and they make us proud. And we also have two very special Eastlake golf teams with us this evening. Um, our Charles Drew Charter School boys and girls varsity golf teams. And before we applaud for them and have them stand, you may remember that in 2019, the Drew Charter School Boys Varsity Golf Team made history as the first all African American golf team to win a state championship in golf. If the coaches and golfers are here, please stand. We're very proud of you. Um, this year's party on the green highlights the East Lakes Foundation's commitment to racial equality, inclusion, and social, social justice while celebrating three amazing women. Women leaders who have many achievements and have provided service to East Lake and beyond. Renee Lewis Glover. Shannon Heath Long Longino, and the Honorable Shirley Clark Franklin. We have a video to show you. Renee had an idea, and an idea that everyone probably thought was crazy. Really high quality housing that suited all people and could allow people who had probably had the least and started behind the started line the best uh, opportunities in housing. All of that grew out of the work between Eckbert Perry and the integral group and myself and hundreds of other people. You had to have both the public sector and the private sector come together to create this new approach. She was the representative of the public side of the public-private partnership with our firm when we introduced the holistic community revitalization model into the city and in our work at transforming Techwood and Clark Howell homes into Centennial Place. And if there wasn't a Centennial Place, there would be no East Lake, there would be no West Highlands, there wouldn't be any of these communities. This model is what's used across the country. All people are children of God with unlimited human potential. This was not just about, well, how do you build some buildings and how do you finance it, but it was also how do we humanize the issue. Every week, Renee Glover and I and then other people from the Housing Authority would come out to East Lake Meadows and we'd meet with Eva Davis and Shannon and other folks on the planning committee to work on what we wanted to do together to help create a healthy neighborhood that connects people with their dreams and aspirations. And she listened to the residents, she listened to the planning committee. Um, her and her team, they, they worked with us. You couldn't walk in and start talking about, well, you know, mixed income and this and that and these financial requirements and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, nobody wanted to hear that. You know, they wanted to know, okay, who are you? 
What are you about? Are you going to stick with it? And what are you going to do? She was leading the charge from the public sector and actually had the audacity uh, to suggest that the federal government needed to modify and amend its approach. We used to go up to HUD together in Washington and you could see the people quake in their shoes when this brainy, reserved woman would walk into the building with the convictions of her conscience. When we went in to meet with the HUD officials, we always had an agenda. We never went in there without something specific that we had thought through, laid out, and we generally needed to have answers. You talk about calm, cool, collected, uh, especially under pressure, and that is absolutely Renee. We gave her the name Terminator. She's tenacious. Um, you can't wear her down. Renee gave me my first job in this industry. She just became very supportive of every move that I've made in my career. Renee Glover was my boss, my mentor, and has become my dear friend over the last 25 years. She helped me become who I have become. Renee Glover is my North Star. I follow her lead because I know how much she knows, and I, uh, I trust her, not just her instincts, but her intellect and her experience. family moved into East Lake in 1971. Our family was the second one to move into the community and I was two weeks old. But over the years it started to transition into a community filled with drugs, shootings, prostitution, activity that would not be a great makeup for a community. You know, people were sleeping on the floor or in bathtubs because of all the crime and all the horror that was going on constantly. Eva Davis, in the first meetings, she made it very clear who was in charge and she wanted better living conditions. Uh, she wanted safety. She wanted um, resources. At eight, she was teaching me how to make, keep records and do all of these things. So it be kinda, I, I became like a backup. But that's where I understood her vision because you're seeing the fails and the triumphs that are going along with the work that she's doing and you're, you have a front seat, you're a witness to it. You know, I thought about this and I said, wow, you know, she was literally just a kid, <laughs> you know, when we started this work, a little teenager. She brought a voice that was really important to this work. Knowing what young adults wanted and needed in their community, knowing what young adults envisioned for their families, their children was really important. And so her voice, I think, was essential and that just passion and drive to make a difference that she learned at that early age continues to just drive her in her personal and professional career. That she's creating her own legacy as well. And I've watched Shannon on a local level, uh, regional, national level, really seize opportunities to have a larger platform bigger than herself. She's helped us think about strategies with other communities. She's spoken at our conference on several occasions. She's just been a great voice for how to do this work with both excellence and equity. I still have to take it in. It's still sometimes overwhelming, and sometimes I just can't believe the work that we did and to continue to see it moving forward. Shannon had the 
the blessing of being Eva Davis's granddaughter. And Shannon radiates all of her grandmother's commitment and understanding in everything that she does. Shannon is great. As long as I've known Shirley, she has been really behind the scenes making things happen and not the person in the front of the line until she became mayor. And Shirley early on said to me, she said it's really about this holistic and integrated approach. You know, when she was mayor, she couldn't focus on one thing. It had to be all the pulling all the right levers that worked. Shirley, for me, is the mix and the articulation of bringing together the East Lake blueprint. The emphasis on mixed income housing, cradle of college education, community wellness, economic development, and a community quarterback to really drive all of that work with partners and with stakeholders. The stakeholders for a project of this size and magnitude are much broader than just the developer, just the housing authority, uh, just the philanthropists, just the civic leaders. And for several years, uh, I worked directly with the Neighborhood Association, uh, the NPU, and with the foundation, helping them to, to understand each other. When she became mayor, she did a great job supporting this kind of work, supporting neighborhoods throughout Atlanta. And then after she left office, she joined Purpose Built Communities as our executive board chair. And that's really where I got to know Shirley the most. It's right after my reelection in 2005, Tom called me with this idea that he wanted, in fact, to form a separate organization and that he thought that I'd be someone who should be engaged in that. Working closely with her at Purpose Built Communities, she helped create our vision, helped create our strategies, um, created relationships with other political leaders around the country that created invitations for us to be able to work in different communities. She's been uh, an essential part of this work and somebody who I, I love and admire. It was perfect for Shirley. It gave her a chance to take that skill set and take it broadly and help move a lot of other communities along. And Shirley was always a community development focused kind of person. The work of Purpose Built is hopeful. It says that yes, we have problems. Yes, we have differences, but we can overcome those differences and we can work together in productive ways and we have a model for doing that. What I really love about Cheryl is how she is deeply passionate about making a difference. I think she's a fabulous human being. She's been very supportive of what we needed at East Lake. She's been involved and at the end of the day she still understands that there's still work to be done. We got to this place over 400 years. 20 years is not enough to overcome it. So the East Lake Foundation has years to go. Without Renee's leadership at the Atlanta Housing Authority, this could not have happened. Without Shannon's voice, on the planning committee, we would have missed the mark. And then without Shirley's leadership, we would not have been able to achieve the kind of impact around the country. And they are really models for the nation of what is possible when you commit your life to being in service to others. They are, for me, women who are living legends.
that was a story. That's, what, that's a story that I wish that everybody could see and know. We thank our honorees for their absolute audacity. The, that's one of your words, Shirley Frank. <laughs> they had that audacity to believe. Ladies, you are an inspiration, all three of you, and that's why we honor you tonight. And you are an example of what it takes to make change. You have to have the will to change. And um, Shannon, if your grandmother was he were here tonight, okay, I would just like kind of like bow to her. That's <laughs> that's the reputation she had for all of us who did and do community in Atlanta. So um, I can't see. I had to. You know how you. <laughs> I got to spot myself here. If that was very, very powerful. Another woman in the audience I want to recognize who had a lot to do with it. She was the founder and president of the Atlanta Neighborhood Development Corporation, Hattie Dorsey. She just left, but we're going to give her a round of applause anyway. Oh, there she is. And then there was Egbert Perry, chairman and CEO of the Integral Group. <laughs> Hattie, Hattie and Egbert were on the host committee tonight. And Egbert is considered an architect behind the concept of mixed use and mixed income communities. His dream for Atlanta is based on his childhood upbringing and experiences in Antigua. And I will tell you, you haven't heard anything until you hear Egbert talk about his father. I, I had the, the opportunity to hear that. And his father in his community was what your, your grandmother was in, at East Lake. So Egbert's uh, mission first put on display when downtown Atlanta's former Techwood Clark Howe development was transformed to Centennial Place. It was a collaboration, as you have heard, with Renee Glover at the, house, at the Atlanta Housing Authority. Egbert is going to introduce Renee Lewis Glover, and I invite you to the podium. Good evening. Had you left your bag over there next to me? What, you didn't want to sit next to me? Okay. okay. All right. So, um, first I want to thank the East Lake Community Foundation for giving me an opportunity on this program to introduce my very, very, very dear friend, Renee Lewis Glover. And I met Renee in 1994, introduced by Hattie, troublemaker, a force unto herself, a force of her own. And it was when I decided to step down at the presidency of Russell to start a company that was going to transform urban America. That's what I thought. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the movie Hidden Figures, right? It celebrates three black women who played pivotal roles, critical roles, in the space program, the very successful space race. Yet, they are totally missing from history. Their achievements were never recognized, and it's now many, many decades later that we're finding out about these hidden figures. And some of these ladies are hidden figures as well. And for me, the ultimate hidden figure is Renee Lewis Glover. So I want to paint a picture for you. It's 1994. Atlanta is the second poorest city in America, 
for any city with a population of more than 200,000 people. It is also the most violent city in America. And there's a piece of property where Techwood Homes, the country's very first public housing project, and Clark Howell Homes, collectively sitting on 60 acres, was the most violent address in this most violent city. That's the picture that was painted. And just so that the destruction of human potential could be complete, all of the kids in those two communities went to a school called Fowler Elementary School, which was habitually the second worst performing elementary school in APS for almost a decade. So you can roll forward what the implications of that or those dynamics are and what that meant we were doing to so many young people. So that version of hell, believe it or not, existed right on the doorsteps of two iconic institutions, Coca-Cola and Georgia Tech, despite their many civic and philanthropic commitments across the city. So what it meant was without intentionality, without intervention, you could not change that dynamic because just being there didn't mean that things were gonna work out fine. And probably not well known, probably still not today, and perhaps the reason why Renee could be the hidden figure that she has been for so long is the fact that Atlanta had the highest per capita concentration of public housing in the entire country at that time. And that fact is not removed or different from some of the other things I mentioned before about crime and so on and so forth. And I made some notes because there were some things I wanted to make sure I got in here because Many of those communities, if you looked at Atlanta in 1994, many of the major corridors into the city and the neighborhoods that were in distress had one thing in common, the concentration of poor black particularly, but black and brown families that were being destroyed. And so it was Renee's visionary leadership at AHA for almost 20 years that transformed many of these neighborhoods and helped make Atlanta the more livable city that it is today. And that's for both those residents that were in public housing that needed a new life and a, a new experience, a new vision, and for new residents as well. And surely, I'm clear, if you never found a way to fund and fix our decrepit sewer systems, <laughs> All of this would have been for naught. And you were both outstanding as a mayor, and I know you're extremely supportive of the work Renee was doing. Unfortunately, and this is probably the saddest part for me, unfortunately, about mm, eight years ago, when Renee was being unceremonially, ceremoniously um, forced out of the agency that 20 years earlier, she stopped from going into receivership. HUD was getting ready to take over the Atlanta Housing Authority in 1994. It was Henry Cisneros that asked her to please do something, otherwise he's gonna have to declare it bankrupt and take it over. He was the HUD secretary. And that's what Renee stepped into. And fast forward, for the last 17 years of a 20-year tenure, not only had she moved the housing authority from being the worst housing authority in the nation to the first, it was the gold standard for housing authorities. Everybody marched to Atlanta to see what the Atlanta Housing Authority was doing. And so when the time came and she was being forced out, she was actually left to fend for herself. That was one of the disappointments I saw and have about how Atlanta dealt with Renee Glover. She was a hidden figure. Yet, she left the then highly effective, 
and scandal-free housing authority with a hundred plus million dollars of cash reserves in its bank account and the properties, all the properties, once the pariah across the city, there were pariahs everywhere, nobody wanted to go there, wanted to touch them. And when she was leaving, everybody was coveting those very same properties, still covet them today. So certainly it's not an understatement to say that Renee has been underrecognized and underappreciated in Atlanta. We've taken for granted the work that she did. And for many of Atlanta's successes, we've credited a lot of other things. We talk about the Olympics, the Beltline, and so on. Let it be very clear, very clear. None of those initiatives ever tried to attack the fundamental problems. They were great efforts. They did a lot for Atlanta but they never went to the heart of taking on the issues of transforming the communities and the lives of the people in those communities. It was Renee's work that did that. And I don't think there's an effort in the last 30 years in Atlanta's history more important and more impactful than the work Renee did when she was in office, when she was at the authority. And her work shaped and redefined housing policy in Atlanta and across the nation and rewrote the rules at HUD. So, in closing, I want to thank the East Lake Community Foundation for recognizing this outstanding, humble servant leader. She never, ever, ever pounds her chest, so I'm taking this opportunity to do it for her. So I welcome Renee Glover. <laughs> After an introduction like that, I'd probably be better off not saying anything. <laughs> but, but I too wrote down some notes because uh, I want to also say about my dear friend and brother, Egbert Perry, uh, that I thank you for that introduction. And many of you don't know this, but uh, Egbert and I met in the summer of 1994 facilitated by Hattie Dorsey, who is also a tremendous leader and impact player and has always been. And you know, Hattie's the force. So uh, thank you. And the other thing is I remember when I first moved here, there was this group called the Atlanta Action Forum where black members of the business community along with white members would get together to talk about issues. And Mike Trotter, who induced me to come down here to Atlanta, said, pointed to Egbert Perry, we were going into a meeting, and he said, that's someone you need to get to know. And that was back in like the mid, late 80s. I moved here in 1986. And I filed that away, and we didn't get to meet each other until Hattie uh, put us together. And so Egbert and I have worked together for 28 years. And I can say without any reservation that he is one of the most brilliant, thoughtful, honest, and caring people anywhere. And his word is his bond. And so, you know, Egbert, is someone who I really adore and respect and love because he's just that kind of human being. So if you haven't had a chance to know him, you really need to reach out. And I would say he too is a hidden figure in so many ways because as we work through uh, coming together as a larger community, uh, we really have to celebrate diversity, and we're still struggling with that, so we need to stay with it. And 
I suspect that our relationship is not unlike the relationships that develop between civil rights leaders who, you know, it's amazing when you try to push things and change things for the better, it's incredible how much resistance there is because uh, change is very uncomfortable. Uh, but as we did the work, and it's funny, all before that time with all the danger and horror, nobody was out protesting. But as soon as we said we wanted to make a difference and we wanted to change the paradigm and we were gonna move families and we were gonna try something new, everybody came out of the woodwork and it was unacceptable. Uh, and Eckbert and I in particular were cursed out, threatened, protested, and eventually sued. Okay, to make things better, I mean, you know, if you put that into context, you know, you have to say, wow, we must really be doing something. You know, they say, if, you, <laughs> if you're doing something and changing the paradigm, it must be making a difference. And so we worked, and we had the uh, anchor of the Olympics uh, under our wings, and that helped tremendously. But we worked tirelessly on creating mixed-use, mixed-income communities of choice so that the future generations, all of these fabulous young golfers, could have the opportunity to tap into their God-given potential so that they could make the world better. So there would not be a centennial place or a villages of East Lake without Egbert, who you heard grew up in Antigua, one of 11 children, Henry Cisneros, the first Hispanic HUD secretary, who, by the way, visited all of the public housing communities across the country, and he actually spent the night with W. Newell, one of the residents at Techwood, because he wanted to hear firsthand what are your problems, what are the needs, what are your aspirations, what are your dreams? Because he wanted to make things better. So just a fabulous human being if you haven't had a chance to meet him. And then of course, we were blessed with thoughtful and compassionate and caring board of commissioners. And I don't know if Cecil Phillips is here tonight, I know he was scheduled to be. Uh, but Cecil Phillips, uh, who is a fabulous human being who chaired the board for 15 years. John Sweet, who was an activist lawyer. And, you know, John walked to walk and talked to talk. And uh, he was chair when, I mean, when the criticisms and the protests and everything were just very, very painful. And Janice Ware a child of the civil rights movement and her dad owned and, and she still owns and operates uh, one of the very influential local newspapers. And um, so, and, and most importantly, the residents who were living in these horrible conditions and the residents like Eva Davis and Andre L. Crowder Jordan and Louise Watley and a whole host of others. They were our version of Fannie Lou Hamer who said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and we want something different. And they held us accountable, you hear me? I mean like, you know, you think you've been held accountable, but they would come in and you know, it was like, this isn't where it needs to be, but it needs to be better. And so we worked because the work was important. The work was important because lives were at stake. Black and brown lives who had been completely marginalized and written off. And you know all the fabulous talent because every black and brown person in here has a story to tell because we did grow up during the era, many of us, of Jim Crow South. Okay, and that was all about 
marginalization and separation and the work that we, that all of us, we, are doing is correcting those issues. So Egbert's vision, this is really an interesting story. He and his best friend uh, traveled throughout the United States to see how urban America, the cities in America could be restored. And so when we met, uh, he was full of this vision and energy, and I was full of this vision and energy after uh, Eva Davis and others had encouraged me to come and be the CEO of the Housing Authority. And I was a little bit nervous, I gotta tell you. But, um, you know, God always provides you what you need. And one of the things that I needed was a great, caring, passionate, honest visionary like Egbert Perry. And what I wanted to do was to end the suffering and mainstream the residents, mainstream the real estate, and mainstream the organization. So after visiting, and I went to every one of the projects, and it was so clear to me that we had to reimagine public housing because what had been done had only systematically been destroying all the people who lived there. And it was heartbreaking. I've never seen that much horror and terror and everybody you talk to, person after person after person said, I'm afraid, I'm afraid my kids are gonna get killed and this is horrible and we need help. And if we support you, and I never get when Mr. Davis said, if I support you, I'm not gonna leave you hanging but I want you to keep your word. And so that was my contract, you know, wasn't all of the stuff that people, you know, worry about. And so um, I embraced Egbert's vision, he and uh, Clyde Gums, and we worked tirelessly because we had this little thing called the Olympics coming. And the good news is that Tech with Clark Howe was right across the street from where the Olympic Village was gonna be, where all the world's press was gonna be. We had sold some land, we being the housing authority, had sold some land for the Olympic Village. And so there wasn't no hiding it. So we said, okay, we gotta get going. We gotta get this thing right, and it's gotta be spectacular. And so after all the work was done, and the approach was holistic, you know, and I think that is a word that's often used for people don't understand, but we're talking about community building. We're not talking about better buildings. We're talking about better quality of life. So Egbert and Clyde's vision was, we gotta have great housing. And like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we gotta break up all of the segregation. Segregation is very dangerous because if we don't know each other, we can think, about each other, whatever it is that we want. We gotta have great schools, we gotta have early childhood development, and all of the economic development that occurs. And you can see it beautifully displayed here and at Centennial Place, but the work was important. And most importantly, we invested in the lives of the residents so they could overcome the trauma, so that they could let their lives shine. So, Henry Cisneros and Hutt embraced what they saw at Centennial Place, going back to the fact that he had spent the night at Debbie Newell's, and he saw and he loved what was happening. And by the way, <laughs> Henry Cisneros, if he did not have courage, none of this would have happened either because you were talking about completely transforming the paradigm. And that meant that there were gonna be public-private partnerships, and for the first time ever, the properties were gonna be owned by a public-private partnership where the private sector partner was going to be making the decisions, and it was gonna be seamless. And so there were two disruptors that occurred that I wanna point out, because this is important. The first was introducing private market 
principles in private financing and private for-profit developers into the mix because by and large, that's where everybody lives. Everybody lives in a privately developed community. Nobody's aspiring to live in government housing. The second disruptor was the economic integration. So market rate families, so the housing had to be appealing because the fact of the matter is that if the housing wasn't great, market rate families weren't going to live there. And what that did is it brought and introduced disposable income and sustainability into the mix. And for the first time, you could see grocery stores and great schools and all of the things that make great communities great. So what Egbert and I learned is that we were challenging the status quo, and that's what brought out all of the protests and the anger and the vitriol and all of that. And um, we stuck with it, and we came through. And so all across Atlanta, I saw David Dwyer here, who worked at the uh, Housing Authority and was instrumental in the revitalization of Capitol Homes and, and Grady Homes. And it takes, it really takes a village to get all of this work done. And so I'm going to close now because I'm sure you're saying, gee, you know, we, we all want to go watch the Braves win. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the great news is that the work is thriving and it's held and there's more work to do. And so my challenge to each and every one here tonight is to keep the movement going. We are being challenged today by forces that have, quite frankly, put us in a position where we have to decide, do we want to embrace diversity or do we want to go back to our separate corners and go do what, we, what, what we've done historically? And we know that doesn't work because before we embrace diversity, none of this would have happened. And so we've got to stick with it, and, but we've also got to take a stand about these issues because this is so critically important. This is great work. And so let's not let bigotry and petty thinking and fear of the other and ego and personal aggrandizement get in the way of important work because we've got more to do. And the one thing that I know is that all people are children of God with unlimited human potential. And as God's children, we are both the same and different at the same time. And the beauty in that is that God created this array of difference, and he has challenged us to see the beauty and the strength in diversity. And that's what we've got to do, because if we do the right thing, all of this is happening here in at Centennial Place, and all across the country because we're doing the right thing, we can create a country and a nation that is strong and competitive for the future. So I look forward to the day that Atlanta actualizes as the, the cradle of the civil rights movement building the beloved community. So I want to close and say, Shirley Franklin, you're going to always be my mayor, okay? <laughs> so, a lot of people don't know this about Shirley, but in addition to being, you know, community-oriented and passionate, she's a tremendous leader. And she took on things that nobody wanted to do. I remember I she said, oh, <laughs> okay. Right. Well, anyway, Shirley, 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 I love you, we love you, you're fabulous. And Shannon, 
Shannon, we're so proud of you. I mean, here she is, Senior Vice President at Truist, and beginning her own legacy and building community. I mean, that's her passion, that's her love, and I'm so proud of you. You are fabulous, and we love you. So, I also want to thank the East Lake Community Foundation, Danny Shoy, and I want to give a shout out to Tom and Ann Cousins because they have embraced this work and they want to make it a national movement and they're well on their way. Lillian Gianelli, you're fabulous and thank you so much. Greg Gianelli, he's fabulous. We love you, we thank you. Carol Naughton, you know, you're the bomb. And Brady Stringer, the love of my life, who I met 20 years ago, and I know I have to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> uh, he actually helped me form the transition team when I first went to the Housing Authority. He worked with uh, Dr. Ed Irons from Clark Atlanta University. That's another little known th fact, but uh, it takes the village. I'm honored, I thank you, and I love everyone. And Ingrid said, if you don't sit down, I'm gonna knock you down. <laughs> You know, uh, this evening we're, we're hearing about um, the sheroes and heroes uh, in our community as we listen to our honorees talk and we listen to the stories of building community. It is Community Building 101 and could serve as a white paper, I am sure. So Egbert, thank you for that introduction of Renee and Renee, thank you for that white paper. <laughs> and now I have the honor of introducing Shannon Heath Lon Longino. Shannon lives a life of community activism. You ask her what's her story, she'll tell you that Eastlake is her story. She describes herself as a proud product of East Lake. She was, I, I loved hearing her talk about how her grandmother caught, taught her to take notes. And she's been talk, taking notes ever since. She was the youngest member of the East Lake Planning Committee, the committee led by her beloved grandmother, Eva Davis. And Shannon learned early on how to give voice to the voiceless. Shannon's dedication to the East Lake community will always be a part of her identity. Over the years, as she raised her family and developed her career, she has worked tirelessly to recognize and celebrate her grandmother's amazing legacy in this community. All the while, she has become and she has been a force for change in her own right as a staunch advocate for affordable housing, for low-income families, and for equitable opportunities for students in, the East, in East Lake and across Atlanta. She currently serves as Senior Vice President for Asset Management at Truist, formerly SunTrust, and that's a recent promotion, just so you know. She is chair of the Institute of Real Estate Management's Federal Housing Advisory Board and vice chairperson of the Charles Drew Charter School Board of Directors. Please join me as we honor her and her service to her community and to all of us, an advocate extraordinaire. Ms. Shannon, won't you come to the stage? Good evening. I wasn't aware that I was supposed to speak. I was told to follow directions. Um, so 
but let me just say, I won't keep you long, but I will say that you are looking at a proud product, not just of East Lake, not just of affordable housing, but a proud product of determination. There are labels that are put on us when we arrive on this earth. I realize that the average person of my color comes in at zero on the map. Growing up in East Lake, I came in at a negative 10 on the map. I was born black, I was born poor, and I had no parents. My grandmother raised me. So all of those challenges for a child to try to work through is horrifying, intimidating, and it makes you feel, where is your place on this earth? But Eva Davis took me in from her daughter as I was two weeks old, and she said, you will be somebody. Each and every time that it was exhausting to be the only child, to be the underdog, to be told I wasn't good enough, to be told I shouldn't be at this table, to, to be told I don't fit in this room, to be told that I am not going to amount to anything. She'd slap the hell out of every doubt and say, that's not happening. With her, I was able to overcome so many things in my life, and I would not be who I am if it weren't for that woman. While fighting her own battles, the connection that she and I had, she had 30 grandchildren, but she chose to raise me. And my question to her was, why me? Her response was, she's an only child, I'm an only child. Her mom was taken to go pick cotton and she was raised by a white, a white sheriff in Crawfordville, Georgia. And my mom was gone. So, I was the connection to her, and she needed me, and I needed her. Eva Davis Way is the street that I thank Lily, the East Lake Foundation, all of our leaders, our neighborhood partners, for backing me up and getting that street renamed, because at the end of the day, it was her way. Even when. Even when we did not understand, I did not understand, why is this lady raising hell all the time? <laughs> why can't I be a normal kid? Why can't we just be normal over in this place? It was hard living there. Our apartment was firebombed twice, and we jumped out of windows to survive because they were trying to kill her. They did not want to see this neighborhood redeveloped. They did not want to see it cleaned up. At the same time I was being busted Buckhead, my grandmother was part of the lawsuit that started the M to M program where minority to majority could have where you see black kids being busted Buckhead. I was one of the first kids of 25 from East Lake to attend Garden Hills Elementary and Kindergarten. I went to Sutton Middle School. I went to North, North Side High School, which is now North Atlanta. But being bus to Buckhead each day gave me a clear view of the disparities that we were living in. I lived in hell, and my world transitioned to heaven every day in Buckhead to see how the other half lived, and then bus back to hell every day. I was speaking three languages by fifth grade, playing two instruments. I didn't fit in at East Lake. I was re referred to as a white girl because I was speaking standard English, and I did not fit in. I went to Buckhead. I did not fit in in Buckhead because they knew I was from East Lake. So where does a kid fit in? Guess what? I was never made to fit in, and I was okay with that. So when I work at Tru while I work at Truist, as I've worked at the Housing Authority, and I will say this, you know, Renee gave me my first job. 
I asked her, I, wanted, I went to her against my grandmother's wishes and said, I would like to be able to see different and change the cycle and break the cycle. I'm a product, but I want better. Each time that I have applied for a job and gotten promoted, I've always called the same two people. That's Carol Naughton and that's Renee Glover. And can I use you as a reference? They never blinked each time I called them. They've watched me grow. They knew when I was pregnant, and my, my twin boys are now 28. Caleb is in the room, my husband Damon, Kyla, they're here with me, and my son Corbin can't join us today because he's graduating from a government agency on Monday, and I'll go see him. But when I tell you that no one can tell me that investing in communities and investing in others does not work. I'm a proud product and I try to explain to each person that I come in contact with is if you come out of your comfort zone, if you come out of your bubble, if you come out of your thought process, your pocketbook, your whatever it is that you're stuck in, there's a whole nother world out there that you don't even know about. There's a whole nother world. So the transition from East Lake every day and go to Buckhead and come back, we would go through so many neighborhoods, starting out at Eastlake, cutting through Kirkwood, going down Moreland, cutting up North Avenue, going through Herndon Homes, cutting up Northside Drive, ending up at Northside High School, Sutton Middle School in Garden Hills. You guys, have, have you guys taken the street route to Buckhead before? So imagine starting from the pictures that you saw and then ending up where you're looking at mansions and rich kids every day. Only to come back and be faced with, I come back and this is what I have. But guess what? That was motivation. Because if I didn't know how to get it, Eva Davis had a black book that said if we can't get it, we're gonna figure it out. If I can't figure it out, we know somebody who can. So I became to people as Miss Eva Davis's granddaughter. And I still remind people that I'm Eva Davis's granddaughter because sometimes that's how they remember me. But anytime I needed homework assignments or anything that she couldn't help me with, grab that black book. I could be calling John Lewis's house, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could be calling Bill Campbell's house, I didn't know. All I would say, she said, get that black book, dial this number, and tell them you're Eva Davis's granddaughter and tell them what you want. <laughs> so, needless to say, as an adult, I did not know that there were many people sitting in our living rooms on Sundays, she would have the most visitors. Are any WWF fans in the house? Tony Atlas, Abdullah the Butcher, wrestler number one, wrestler number two, were regulars at our house on Sunday. <laughs> but what I will tell you is, she opened up, Hosea Williams, again, Congressman Lewis, our, our apartment was just this smuggler's board for change. They knew she knew how to get it done. And I was the bartender, I was the note taker, I was the minute taker. Whatever it was that she assigned me, I took in every single thing because at the end of the day, this lady did not have to pour into me. She did not have to invest in me. And she believed in me when no one else would. So at the end of the day, she saw some things in me that I had not even recognized. So I've had some people, and thank you, Danny, and so many others, who says, you're always telling your grandmother's story, but you have one of your own. I had not thought of it that way. I was so busy trying to make sure she wasn't forgotten. But I was told I have to remember that I'm still here and I must be remembered. So I'm remembering me by continuing to do the legacy that she started. I've picked up the torch. There's more work to do. I'm not done yet. So when you see me smiling, when you see me coming, when you see me advocating, when you see me shaking hands, when you see me hugging you, 
You're an ally. You're someone we can use. You're a voice. You matter. And I'm asking each of you, as Renee said, come together. There's more work to do. I'm not done yet. And however we can support each other in carrying this mission forward, let's do that. Thank you so much, East Lake Foundation. Thank you, guys. Wow. I think that was like a class. Lessons to learn, and we had a professor. Thank you again, Shannon. Thank you. And now our final, last, but never least, awardee, honoree, is the Honorable Shirley Clark Franklin. And I have the honor of introducing her, and I've had the honor of knowing her for over 40 years. I was going to pinpoint those years, and I decided to keep it general. <laughs> As we know, all know that Sir Shirley Franklin served as Atlanta's mayor. And before that, she served in the administrations of two very distinguished and powerful mayors, Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. and Mayor Andrew Young. She indeed is and always has been, in my mind, a public servant. And more than that, she is a student of public policy. Her government service spans well, uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not going to count the decades. And there's a lot to celebrate in there, and, and we can't celebrate it all tonight. But she may be best known for being, as Renee was getting ready to talk about, <laughs> the sewer mayor. The sewer mayor, and I mean, People still refer to her. I was in Detroit recently, and people still refer to her as the sewer mayor because that was for her commitment to upgrading the city's aging water and sewer system under a federal uh, consent decree. Now, you know, and that was before all the conversation around infrastructure. And we see what has happened to those who have not upgraded their infrastructure. So just for being the sewer mayor, Shirley Franklin, uh-uh, you're not ready to come up yet. But we're going to give you a round of applause for just the sewer mayor. During her eight years as mayor, she championed tough ethics and implemented sweeping government operational reforms. That's tough stuff. She engaged the business community through the Atlanta Committee for Progress, out of which some very significant work streams came. Grady Hospital, Pete, the late Pete Carell led that. The Beltline, Phil Kent led that. Um, the Center for Civil and Human Rights. She brought that to the Atlanta Committee for Progress. And the Coca-Cola Company and Neville Isdell stepped up and donated the land for the Center for Civil and Human Rights. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But I remind you, all three of those were tough stuff. She's done a lot of interesting things since being mayor. She taught at Spelman College. She taught at the Lyndon Baines Johnson School of Public Affairs at, uh, at the University of Texas in Austin. She served on the, Delta Airline, on the Delta Airlines board and as executive chair of Purpose Built Communities. Currently, she chairs the board of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, and she serves as a member of the board for Mueller Water Products, 
American Institute of Architects, the CDC Foundation, the Volcker Alliance, and Purpose Built Schools of Atlanta. And there is so much more that I could say about Shirley. Um, I could talk about her golf game, but I don't think she wants me to talk about that at East Lake. <laughs> I could talk about her travel log. She's never seen a body of water that she didn't want to get to for vacation. I could talk about, with great verb, her exquisite garden, which she plants, she grows, and she tends and she eats, and she shares with her friends all the time. But I will close by saying, one of my proudest moments with Shirley Franklin was watching her accept the John F. Kennedy Profiles and Courage Award at the Kennedy Center. She got that award for doing tough stuff. And I am sure that when she looks around and sees the smiling faces of our East Lake youth and the children at Drew Elementary School and so many other initiatives that she was involved in that involve young people, this award will rise to the top of her award list. So please join me in welcoming a woman who needs no introduction, but I gave her one anyway, the Honorable Shirley Clark Franklin. Thank you all. It's good to be with you. So I've been getting text messages from some of my friends in the audience who are saying, how are you going to top that? You don't want to follow Shannon. You don't want to follow Renee. Well, you know, I, they are wonderful, and congratulations. You told great stories, and you are phenomenal women. And I am really proud to be honored along with you today. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the Eastlake Foundation. Uh, to Danny, who called me and said, are you kidding me? I said, you, could, you must be kidding me. <laughs> and he said, no, we want to do this. So I, I agreed. It's hard to turn down the East Lake Foundation because of all the wonderful things that have happened here and all the people who've come together to make it happen. So there are a lot of individual stories um, that we could tell, but this really is a story of a community that came together. Um, people came from all walks of life uh, and found a way uh, to support the foundation, to support the families and the young people. And it wasn't easy, um, but so what? My theory, my theory, my theory is someone else will do the easy things. You know, our, our job is to do the hard stuff. The things that people don't think are possible. And frankly, it takes just as much time to do the easy stuff sometimes. So all of those awards that uh, Ingrid talked about, every single one of them is for sewers. <laughs> every single one of them was for sewers. Because uh, anyway, it just was. So um, I see, I know Greg was here, and uh, there you are, Greg, standing all the way in the back, and Beth Chandler. Um, I, I, I named them because they were cabinet members during my term in office, and a big part of what um, made Atlanta successful during those eight years um, had to do with the hard work and the creativity um, that they brought uh, to the work. Uh, I am honored. Uh, Atlanta is a great city. It's been great to me. Uh, it's been great to many people, but not nearly enough yet. And that has been said. Um, we can say it. We can write about it. We can tell our friends about it. But if we don't do anything about it, we fall short. So the purpose, I presume, of coming together like this is to really get us to recommit. Uh, not to talking about it, not to remembering it, 
um, not even to thinking about it, but to doing something about it. You've heard some stories where people did the work. They did the work not really knowing that they could do it at the time, but they knew the work was valuable enough to try. Um, I also, I've been getting lots of directions, you know. People think I'm still mayor and they just tell me what to do. Uh, Eric, I want to recognize you uh, for the amazing work that you've done in community development with Egbert and, and the team at Integral. Here, here. Does anybody else would like me to say something? Cynthia? Cynthia? Cynthia Coleman? This will be the one story I tell. I, after I left City Hall and I was working with Purpose Built and I was in a room with Cynthia and I think with Carol and a few, and Greg and a few other people, and uh, they were giving us the statistics on the achievement level of the students uh, by grade level and by standardized tests. I'm not a big fan of standardized tests, but anyway. Uh, and they showed uh, the performance level. Um, and I said, that looks great. You know, I'm a mayor. You're at 85%? That's great. Cynthia said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Heaven forbid that number is not 100%. And indeed, that has been the goal from the very beginning. So kudos to you, Cynthia, for guiding us through that, to that process. So I didn't have dessert. And I don't know if dessert's still out there. But they said I had to stay until 10 o'clock, so I'm going to get dessert. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. So I realize you have been sitting for a while, so I promise not to be long. Um, and I normally don't use notes, but I am going to use some tonight because the most important thing for me to do is to do some quick thank yous. So once again, I'm Danny Shoy, uh, President and CEO of the East Lake Foundation, and I had to introduce myself because the beard is gone from the video, so you all might not recognize me. Uh, I am the lucky successor of Greg Giornelli, Carol Naughton, and Madeline Adams. And how wonderful it is to have all three of my predecessors in the room tonight. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, thank you, that deserves a round of applause. Madeline, wave, Madeline's in the back, Carol's up front, and Greg, who I think waved, Greg is all the way in the back at the door. Okay, all right. Um, so yes, it's still me, the same brain, different face, and a very full heart. I realize that I stand between you, more good food and drinks, music, and the rest of the Braves game, if there's any left, and don't worry, it will be on the screens so that you can enjoy it and the music. But my responsibility is some thanks and some very, very, very super short comments that I'm gonna make even shorter than they already were. So thank you to, and hold your applause, I actually studied this, it takes like four seconds every time you clap, between thanks, I'm going to ask you to hold the applause here till the end. But I want to make sure that we thank the, we, the ESAC Foundation, thank the Golf Channel, h &S Sports, all seven of our competing teams, and I say seven, not eight, because we have one team represented on both sides here. Uh, and as I thank the Golf Channel and h &S Sports and our teams, I'm hoping that you saw what we realized that bringing these two amazing events together could do. This is so much bigger than golf. Um, I want to thank the two Tom Cousins award winners, Dylan, for your resilience. And I will never think about my car the same way because of your analogy about the passenger seat. Uh, Phoebe, for your compassionate philanthropy, thank you. So last year, we had the um, ESA Cup, but we did not have Party on the Green because of COVID-19. So what a joy it is to bring these together and have these be a beautiful blend of community, and our efforts to honor racial equity, inclusion, and justice. And 
Our 2019 honoree, if you were here for that, happened to be Billy Payne, who everyone knows from Augusta National. You know Billy as the uh, chairman of the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games. But it's not lost to me as I thought about COVID-19, as I thought about the civil unrest, as I thought about the political instability and what those three things did as a trifecta in 2020 and in 2021, it wasn't lost on me that when everybody was woe about the Olympics being a year delayed, that the beauty of that was that we are 25 years from the Olympics being in Atlanta. How beautiful is that, right? And when you think about the, Olymp the Olympics and you think about what Renee and others have said and the audacity to dream, because that's what the Olympics are really about, it's not about sports, and you think about that trifecta and all the things that divide us, we are reminded that proximity is important and it's a key factor in community. So coming together tonight, we can dream again. The Drew Golf Team reminds us, not just the boys, we give a lot of due credit to the boys, but also to our young ladies on the golf team as well. Let's give them a round of applause. And girls, Drew Golf Team girls, I hope that you know that you matter tonight and every night and that you've seen images of people who look like you in the honorees tonight and that you don't have to look very far when I think about your athletic director, Tracy Edwards, and the example that she sets every day. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Coach Weems. Uh, so thank you, Ingrid Saunders-Jones. You had the impossible job of being MC with three, not one, not two, but three honorees. And it was important for us to honor Shirley and Shannon and Renee together. That was done by design. Thank you to all of our honorary co-chairs, our host committee members, uh, and honorary co-chairs, just wave your hands where you are. I'm not going to ask you to stand. Just wave. Hold the applause. Host committee, hold the applause. Host committee members, just wave your hands. Eastlake Golf Club staff, thank you for an amazing night. Wave your hands. The Eastlake Foundation board, wave your hands. We have a few board members here. Thank you. The Eastlake uh, East Foundation staff, past and present, because I realize in seeing Scarlett Pre uh, Presley Brown, there are several people who are part of the Eastlake family. Wave your hands if you've ever been on the Eastlake Foundation staff. And currently, I want to particularly thank um, Catherine uh, Woodling, uh, who played a role in tonight and continues to play a role in the Eastlake Cup. Janine, make your come forward. Janine Blanco, come forward. Come forward quickly, Janine. So as Janine is walking forward, I'm going to quickly continue to thank our what we call Eastlake community. So all of our partners that are represented here, uh, tonight, Nonami, Drew Charter School board and staff is here. Purpose Built Communities is represented here. So not only do we have the, you hear a lot about the Eastlake, Commun uh, Eastlake Foundation, excuse me, we used to be Eastlake Community Foundation, but important for me to acknowledge that we have two other neighborhoods in Atlanta doing this amazing work. And that is the Grove Park Foundation and Gavin McGuire, stand up for a second. This is the new executive director <laughs> of the Grove Park Foundation doing the work on the west side in the Grove Park community. We also had, I don't know if he's still here, Jim. Is Jim still here? He's, there's Jim in the back. Jim is the president of FCS, uh, Focus Community Strategies, uh, doing excellent work in historic South Atlanta and also FCS staff that is here. And we have uh, Logan Herring, Logan Stand Up, who came all the way from Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, Eastlake Women's Alliance members, Rhonda Morgan and Rita Breen, if they're still in the room, just wave their hands. So they will talk to all of you women if you want to be engaged with Eastlake. That is a way to get it done. So I'm going to say, what a master class. A woman's work is never done. How lucky are we to have three exemplars tonight with our honorees? Each could have been a program on their own. All three of you wear crowns. You are bold, you are brilliant, you are black. We thank you for all that you are. Um, I had some comments for each of you. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time because all of you know how I feel about you and how much I love you. And Shannon, you particularly, when Shirley said in the video, I could not end the night and not say this, that 20 plus years can't undo what 400 years have done, you are a seed planter. When I look at your family, your husband, your three kids, I know Corbin's not here tonight, and I think about the, the children that you and Damon have raised, now young adults, I have no doubt in my mind that this work will continue because of the work that you've done with your kids. I met your grandmother. I know your grandmother would be proud. 
It is an honor to know you, and I want for you to hear that, not just from me, but from all of us in this room, because no matter how much any of us talk about this work, you lived it. You lived it, and we will never forget that. And that was important for me to sh say again, because Shannon is the person that is the most modest in this room, and often we will overlook. So Janine, come up on the stage. So as we were working tonight um, to get this done, this is really like two years stop, start, on, off in the making because of COVID and the chaos. And what you all don't know is that Janine used to be on the Eastlake Foundation staff full time, um, had to make a different decision and had to leave us in that full time role to tend to take care of her family, her husband and her two school age kids, and she lives an hour away. But I can't tell you how many times I've probably called Janine over the last few years, gotten on her nerves about how we were doing with raising money, how the program was coming together, and I would not do myself justice or any of us justice if I did not thank and acknowledge you for all the work that you've done leading this as a consultant day in day out Janine is responding to emails at wee hours of the morning on the weekends and she brings her kids to Eastlake when she has to let's all thank Janine Blanco for her work thank you so I'm going to end by saying and this part is important as you can tell from tonight, this story goes way back. It goes way back. Uh, you have an opportunity to watch it, so it was on the screens before we started the program. But after tonight, we are going to send all of you in this room a link. We hope that you will open it, pay attention to it. We're not going to tell you how much money we raised tonight for education and COVID-19 recovery. You can find out when you open the email, because we still have money coming in. That's a good problem to have. Um, but we will include a clip of the video that you saw tonight and we want to charge you to tell the story larger than you've known it before because of what you heard tonight. So when you tell the story that you don't only talk about Tom Cousins, you don't only talk about the late Eva Davis, but you add all three of our honorees tonight, that you add Hattie Dorsey in there, a hidden figure, that you add Egbert Perry, a hidden figure, and we make this story so much bigger. So that concludes our formal program. We will ask you to please continue to stay and enjoy this time, treat this as a homecoming to reconnect with family and friends in a way that you've not over the past two years now. Uh, and please remember while you're enjoying the rest of this for the rest of the night, inside and outside, please while you're inside, if you're not actively eating and drinking, PSA, um, to make sure that you wear your mask and that you enjoy the East Lake Cup, the Am Am, uh, happening tomorrow. Uh, and as we already mentioned, the next three days of live televised golf Enjoy the rest of this beautiful night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.